proposed is so responsible. I don't think we're just one good tax increase away from prosperity in this country. And that's in part why I stand in opposition to this amendment. Reserve the balance of my time. Gentlemen's time is reserved. Gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield one minute to the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Corrine Brown. The lady you. from Florida is recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just say I want to first thank the, the uh, Congressional Black Caucus for their leadership and the fact is that they are the conscience of this Congress. Thank you so very much. Let me say that transportation and infrastructure is adequate uh, if adequately funded will generate thousands of jobs. In fact, for every billion dollars we invest in transportation, it generates 44,000 permanent jobs and 6.2 billion in economic activity. With the CBC initial investment of $50 billion in infrastructure funding, this budget will create over 2 million good paying jobs. It would also allow us to fix our failing bridges, aging transportation system, and crumbling roads. In addition, let me mention one thing about the VA. The Republicans often mention uh, what did the Democrats do when they was in charge. We passed the largest VA budget in the history of the United States of America. Republicans often talk the talk Democrats walk the walk. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlelady yields back. Gentleman reserved. Gentleman from Utah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Gentleman is recognized. You have to recognize that how much money the federal government is spending here. You know, we're going to spend in the range of about 3.5, 3.6 trillion dollars in a 12-month period. Part of my question, a rhetorical question here is, if that's not stimulative to the economy, why isn't it? What are we spending our money on if it's not intended to, in part, stimulate the economy? There, there are things that we have to do in terms of security and providing for the FAA and the Department of Defense, but we have to use or utilize those resources in a very wise way. I'll, I'll reserve the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. This time is reserved. Gentleman from Missouri. Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield now one minute to the distinguished lady from California, Ms. Lee. You know, ladies recognize from one, for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me first uh, thank Chairman uh, Emanuel Cleaver for his tremendous leadership of the Congressional Black Caucus and uh, many caucuses in this House. Also, Representative Bobby Scott and Representative Gwen Moore, and all of our CBC colleagues for their tireless effort on this budget. At a time when America is facing the greatest income inequality since the Great Depression, we must stand up and put the needs of the most vulnerable over the wants of the most wealthy, the special interests, and big oil. The Congressional Black Caucus's budget is a moral document that shows our nation's priorities and our values. This budget makes important investments in job creation, transportation, health care, and education. The CBC budget also protects the safety net without cutting Social Security, destroying Medicaid, and ending the Medicare guarantee as the Republican budget does. And we must ensure that those who have borne the brunt of this recession, who have experienced the highest unemployment rates and the highest rates of poverty, communities of color have an opportunity to return to the workplace, support their families, have access to education and the American dream. These should be the values and priorities of a budget, a budget for everyone in mind, not just for the one percent. These are the priorities that will ensure our country and all of its people, not just the one percent, recover fully from this devastating recession. Gentlelady's time has expired. Seconds to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized for 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to point out that the uh, gentleman from Utah has suggested the need to reduce the deficit. The Congressional Black Caucus budget beats the Republican budget by $770 billion. And then he talks about tax increases, but doesn't mention the fine print in the Republican budget that instructs the Ways and Means Committee to find $4 trillion in tax increases. So we, if fiscal responsibility is the idea, the Congressional Black Caucus beats the Republican budget by $770 billion over 10 years. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves his time. Gentleman from Utah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, how much, uh, may I inquire how much time each side has? The gentleman uh, from Utah has eight minutes and the gentleman from Missouri has two and one half minutes. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would suggest that I am, I am uh, 
It is my intention to yield uh, the gentleman uh, some additional time. I know he has a number of speakers that are still left. I'm happy to, to do that. So that is my intention as you allocate the rest of your time. But for now, I will reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time is reserved. I'd like to thank uh, the gentleman from Utah for his uh, generosity and courtesy. I would like to yield now one minute to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Gentlelady from Texas. The gentlelady from Texas is recognized for one minute. I thank the chairman very much, and I thank the chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus for yielding to me, and again, join in my colleagues in thanking him for his leadership, thanking uh, the chairman of our CBC Budget Committee, Mr. Scott, the work that um, Congressman Moore does in this committee, and all others that have gathered here, and I thank my good friends for uh, a vigorous debate, uh, and would only uh, say to you that in the course of our debate uh, this evening and today, we've heard of the mountain of debt and uh, the need to cut, 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 and it is all right to have a difference of opinion. But what I would argue is that there are documented economists that say that if you invest in human capital, if you invest in people, then you build up the economy, you make things, you make things in America. I don't want to leave Americans on the, uh, uh, if you will, on the trash heap of despair. I don't want to leave bodies straddled all along the highways, of those who are knocking on doors of colleges, those who are trying to get into uh, primary and secondary education, seniors who are cast out on the streets out of nursing homes. That's where we're going. Can I have an additional minute? Mm -hmm. The other gentlelady, an additional minute. Is recognized for one additional minute. Thank you. So I'm standing here to try to end uh, the elimination of Medicare and the destruction of jobs and uh, the taking of... Out in order, please. Uh, I hate the committee that, will be in order. The gentleman is correct. Uh, and the uh, taking of money from the poor. The CBC budget is responsible in that it's ending the mortgage interest deduction for vacation homes and yachts. It provides uh, the additional taxes relief for the middle class, $25 billion for education and job training increase, $50 billion in transportation infrastructure, creating jobs, rolling back the harmful cuts to American federal employees, recognizing that they provide uh, services that are needed, $12 billion above the president's budget regarding NASA with advanced research and development programs. That's the genius of the 21st century, providing more funding for the National Science Pro uh, Foundation. And yes, we believe in justice. We support full funding of Department of Justice with funding for the cops on the beat, second chance, the Civil Rights Division. I will tell you that the message tonight has to be that we don't want to take food from the poor people. We don't want to make it harder for low-income students to get college degrees, squeeze funding for research, education, infrastructure. We want to take people off that trash heap of despair and let them walk into glory. Let's support the CBC budget. And I yield back. General Lady yields back. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Missouri. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, let me uh, just say, uh, let me ask uh, with the, the uh, generosity of the gentleman from Utah, how much time do we have? Gentleman has 30 seconds remaining. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Utah. I, I, I would like to yield two minutes to the gentleman if, uh, if he needs it, has additional speakers. Gentleman is recognized. I will, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield uh, one minute to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Richardson. The gentlelady from California is recognized for one minute. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in strong support of the Congressional Black Caucus's alternative budget for, f for fiscal year 2013. This budget should be considered and made in order by all of our colleagues. Minority communities took the hardest hit during the economic recession. In my district, we suffer rates of unemployment ranging as high as 25 percent, home foreclosures, and significantly higher experiencing pain than across the country. The CBC alternative budget 
deals with these issues, helping us to have a skilled, educated workforce that can tackle the 21st century. It increases the maximum Pell Grant award, which we desperately need, invests in an additional $25 billion of the President's budget in education and job training, invests an additional $50 billion in job-creating transportation infrastructure projects, and provides an additional $5 billion for the President's budget to help people in our communities with foreclosures. Mr. Speaker, we stand today, I stand in support of the CBC budget and urge my colleagues to support it as well. And I reserve the balance of my time to the gentleman. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me uh, close out our side by thanking the gentleman. And first of all, I want to call attention to one thing, and I think it's important. It, it may be more important than the discussion of the budget because I think it helps us eventually reach budgets. Not one speaker on this side call this the Ryan budget. I was in an interview this morning and someone asked me about what I thought about the Ryan budget. And I said, this is the Republican budget. And if I attack the budget, it seems as if I'm attacking the man whose name seems to be attached to it. This institution is far too important for us to get down into that kind of thing. We have some real differences in this budget. I believe, and our budget reflects, that the budget is an x-ray of our inners. It is a moral document. It tells who we are. And I say in another position in my life, if you show me your checkbook, I can tell you what you believe in. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Utah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cha Chairman. I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. I, I do appreciate the gentleman's comments, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, the generosity and the, uh, the approach that he took that, yeah, we should debate the issues, but we don't need to attack the person. I think is the right attitude, and I appreciate the, the comments uh, about our chairman, Chairman Ryan. I remember what Speaker Boehner said at the beginning uh, when I started. He said, we may disagree, but we shouldn't be disagreeable. So I appreciate the spirit in which we do this today. This is a contrast. There is, a, there is a difference in opinion in, in the direction that we should handle, or w which we should go. I fundamentally, fundamentally don't believe that we're just one good tax increase away from prosperity in this country. I think one of the problems and challenges in this nation is that our government is overreached. It is spending too much money, it is borrowing too much money, and it is regulating too much. Is there a proper role for regulation? Absolutely. Absolutely. And where it's a necessity, we need to prioritize it. We need to fix those things that aren't working. But what we have proposed as the House Republicans in our budget is a responsible, bold budget. It's also a realistic budget that over the course of time balances the books and pays off the debt. That is the imperative of our nation. Because as I cited earlier, we have to leave. We should leave this nation better than the way we found it. And that means creating opportunity for this nation to thrive. We need to remember that manufacturing is good in this nation. We need to remember that Yes, we have to make investments, but to protect our nation. You know, the, I look at the president's budget, and the only thing I see that it cuts is defense, and the only thing it drills is your wallet. I don't believe that that's the direction of our nation. And that's why we're debating this issue in contrast to the United States Senate, which is more, for more than 1,050 days now has not even brought a budget to the floor to debate. That is fundamentally and morally wrong. I'm proud of the fact that this body is doing this. And I uh, encourage a no vote on what has been offered as a substitute, but I do encourage members to vote for what passed out of the Budget Committee. I think it's responsible. I think it's bold. I think it's the right move for our nation. And with that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back his time. All time for debate has expired. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Missouri. Those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Opinion no. of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Mr. Chairman, I call for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Missouri will be postponed.
It is now in order to consider Amendment Number Three, printed in House Report 112-423. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment Number Three in the nature of a substitute, printed in House Report Number 112-423, offered by Mr. Cooper of Tennessee. Pursuant to House Resolution 597, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper, and a member opposed, each will control 10 minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a unanimous consent request. I believe that we've agreed to divide the time in a different way. Um, I would like to yield to the gentleman, my friend, from Wisconsin. Gentleman from Wisconsin? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I will claim time in opposition, but I will yield uh, half my time, uh, five minutes, to the uh, gentleman from uh, Tennessee. Without objection, so ordered. Gentleman Mr. from Tennessee. Mr. Chairman, a further unanimous consent request. I would like to yield half of my time, seven and a half minutes, to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. La Tourette. Without objection. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I have the honor tonight of representing the budget that's endorsed by Simpson and Bowles. This is the only bipartisan budget that the House of Representatives will be able to consider in this budget cycle. This is the first time that a Bowles-Simpson budget has been allowed on the floor of the House or the Senate. This is a historic night, and I hope that members will appreciate this opportunity. This is one of the most partisan weeks in Washington, and this is the only bipartisan way to solve the nation's problems. This is the only budget that has a chance of getting through both the House and the Senate. I hope members will appreciate this opportunity. Mem members have expressed interest, but in this partisan week, we've been hammered by forces on both the left and the right people who do not want America to solve its problems in a sensible and fair manner. To illustrate what we're doing here, the Wall Street Journal today had a graph of the different budget alternatives. The top line here is assuming current policies, clear trouble for the nation because we're not reducing the deficit. The blue line here is the White House budget, which makes considerable progress in solving our problems. The bottom line here is the GOP plan, which is tough and completely partisan. There's not a single Democrat in the country that will support that. So it's a budget to nowhere. It's a bridge to nowhere. In between the White House budget and the GOP plan is the bipartisan proposal, the Simpson Bowles endorsed budget. It's very tough on deficits. It gets the job done, and it gets the job done in a bipartisan fashion. So I hope that my colleagues will focus on this budget alternative. We have precious few minutes to debate this, a total of 15 minutes when the other side had four hours. This is a David versus Goliath situation. But I hope not only members of this body will pay attention, but the public back home, because they want us to solve our problems in a peaceable, fair fashion. They're tired of political bickering. We have the chance in this House tonight to stop the political bickering and pass a good, tough, fair budget for America. Mr. Chairman, I reserve the balance of my time, and I yield uh, to the, uh, the other side. Gentlemen's time is reserved. Mm -hmm. Gentleman from Wisconsin reserves. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I just want to clarify with the unanimous consent request. I, I understand that Mr. Cooper's unanimous consent request not only yielded me seven and a half minutes, but also authority to yield time on that time. Is that correct? That is correct. I, I Gentleman thank, is correct. I thank the chair and I thank Mr. Cooper for his courtesy and his partnership. And I want to begin by saying something nice about Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan's got one of the toughest jobs in the country. Uh, it's like herding cats to get uh, new guys, old guys, and everybody else. And I yield myself a minute and a half. Uh, to, uh, to put together the budget that he has for the last two years. <clears throat> However, as Mr. Cooper indicated, his budget is a Republican budget. Mr. Van Hollen's budget is a Democratic budget. Now, uh, recently, uh, there's an organization called Political Fact that sort of checks out what public figures say about certain things. This particular chart, Pants on Fire, was awarded for the biggest lie of 2011, and that was those who claimed that Mr. Ryan's last budget ended Medicare as we know it. They got the distinction of, of being pants on fire for all of 2011. As Mr. Cooper indicated, we have been viciously attacked from the left and the right, and when you know you have a good deal is when the left and the right are pounding the snot out of you, and that's what's happening here today. So I want to give some pants on fire to some of the, some of the claims that are being made. The claim that this creates a path for Medicare premium support, if you're making that argument, your pants are on fire. 
This slashes benefits for Social Security recipients. False. Your pants are on fire. This is a $2 trillion tax hike. False. Your pants are on fire. Repealing the sequester means $1 trillion in increased spending. False. Your pants are on fire. This would decimate the defense budget. False. Your pants are on fire. This encourages tax avoidance. Yield myself another 30 seconds. I was recognized. This encourages tax avoidance by corporations and will ship jobs overseas. Your pants are on fire. The recession would worsen under Simpson Bowles. Your pants are on fire. GDP plus one requires deep cuts in health care, including Medicare. Your pants are on fire. And the Simpson Bowles budget would decimate domestic programs and force massive cuts. Your pants are on fire. And anybody that wants to read about it, come see Mr. Cooper or I, and we will put your pants out. Thank you. The gentleman's time is reserved. The gentleman from Wisconsin. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield myself two and a half minutes. The gentleman uh, is recognized. And then I'll just do two and a half minutes to close. Um, first of all, the reason I wanted to yield these gentlemen time, half our time, is I don't know why they weren't yielded the same amount of time that the other substitutes were. I don't know why that happened, but it's wrong that it, it happened the way it did. That's why I want to give them those five minutes. I also want to congratulate them for, you know, putting a plan on the table. It's nice to see. We don't see that too often these days. Uh, I served on the Simpson Bowles Commission, and I voted against it, and I want to explain why. Um, and, and I'll use the numbers from this budget to show. Number one, it keeps Obamacare in place. It keeps PAPACA in place. This budget does too, because it's current law, so unless you rescind it, the spending of it, you're keeping Obamacare in place. And, and I have a problem with that health care law. I think it's a bad one. This budget and Simpson Bowles keeps it in place. Number two, it doesn't address the real drivers of our debt, which are these health care entitlement programs. Simpson Bowles didn't do it. This one doesn't either. And to me, you're really not dealing with the driver of our debt unless you do that. Uh, number three, on revenues, uh, based on the baseline, it has $1.8 trillion in higher revenues. That does mean higher taxes. The last year of this particular budget uh, has higher revenues than the Democratic substitute and the President's budget. Um, the spending cuts, when you look at baseline, compared to the current law baseline, the one we all measure against here, and you take out the war gimmick, it only has $27 billion of spending cuts over 10 years. Um, by contrast, our budget has $3.3 trillion. So I, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of the war gimmick. If you take out that war thing, this only cuts about $27 billion off the current law baseline. Um, it, it claims that this cuts $4 trillion in deficit reduction. I'm not sure what baseline is being used to do that, um, but on the current policy baseline, this really only has $2.5 trillion of deficit reduction. 72% of that comes from tax increases and 28% come from spending reductions. So I want to simply say amen for bringing a plan to the table. I have tremendous respect for Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson and Jim Cooper and Steve LaTourette because they're here being a part of the solution by offering a solution and not being a part of the problem. So first, I think that just goes without saying, but it bears repeating. I just don't like the substance of it. I think it's going to end up pushing people into Obamacare whose costs will explode, and I think it's going to be bad for our health care system, and it doesn't deal with the primary drivers of our debt. And I don't want to see a big tax increase before you deal with the entitlement programs, because then you're just chasing higher spending with higher revenues. And I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman's time is reserved. Gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Chairman, I yield one minute of time to my good friend, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Andrews. Gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for one minute. I ask unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. Without objection. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I think there's a consensus in America we have to reduce our deficit. Most of it should be by cutting spending, and some of it should come in revenue contribution from the wealthiest Americans. This proposal does this, so I support it. I'll tell you the other reason I support it. I want our country to have enough resources that a child can get the best education they should. We won't if we don't control the deficit. I want her mother to get a college education and a good job. We won't if we don't control the deficit. I want her grandmother to have Social Security and Medicare. We won't if we don't control the deficit. If you believe in the progressive things government can do, you must believe and act on reducing the deficit. This is the best and bipartisan way in front of us. I urge a yes vote. Mr. Chairman, I'd now like to yield one minute to my friend, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Wolf, who actually helped me with the original Cooper-Wolf legislation that helped spawn the Simpson-Bowles Commission.
take one minute of our time and give it to Mr. Wolf for a grand total of two. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two minutes. As Simon and Garfunkel said in the song, The Boxer, man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. I tell the gentleman, I am opposed to Obamacare and voted against it 26 times. America is in trouble. America is facing economic collapse. We have $15.2 trillion debt, and by the end of this year, when you hang your Christmas tree lights up with Christmas tree lights made in China, it will be at $17 trillion. We're borrowing money from China, where there are 25 Catholic bishops under house arrest, hundreds of Protestant pastors under house arrest, and we're doing nothing about it. We borrowed money from Saudi Arabia that funded the Radic Madrasas up along the Afghan-Pakistan border that led to 9-11, that led to where we are, quite frankly, with regard to Afghanistan. When I go in every high school in my district, I ask the young people, is the Social Security system sound and will be there when you retire? In the last three years, not one has raised their hand. The, the seniors in my congressional district know more than this Congress and know more than this administration. The president has walked away and has failed the Congress. Both political parties have walked away and failed. I commend my uh, friend, Mr. Cooper and Mr. LaTourette, and ask for a yes vote on the Simpson-Bowles Commission to yell back to bounce my time. Gentlemen, yield back his time. Extend. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Chairman, if no one else is seeking time, I would like to yield uh, one and a half minutes to my friend from Oregon, Mr. Schrader, who, along with Mr. Quigley, Mr. Lipinski, and Mr. Costa, have been invaluable partners in pushing the Simpson Bowles budget. The gentleman from Oregon is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I really commend uh, uh, Mr. Cooper and Ms. Latterer for bringing this uh, bipartisan proposal forward. It's really time, America, to focus on things we agree on, not things that we disagree on. America wants to see us as uniters, not dividers, in this business down here. Uh, this is the only uh, bipartisan proposal that's going to be offered. It is going to be the framework for whatever deal we come to come the end of uh, this year, when we're staring the Bush tax cuts uh, uh, going off, when we're staring uh, uh, extreme defense cuts in the face. This is the proposal, in some form, that will be adopted. This proposal recognizes there's a balance. You know, it's not perfect. There's some, uh, some groups are very paid at the altar, quite frankly. But this is the only proposal that's bipartisan. It actually addresses the two big drivers. Our revenues are an all-time low, lowest since World War II. You're not going to have a vibrant economy without revenue to support our schools, our infrastructure, our transportation, our economic development. Yes, the entitlements are a problem, the gentleman from Wisconsin, while he's not in favor of some aspects of health care bill, adopts all of the savings that we did in the last Congress because there are good, efficient ways to improve the life and insolvency of Medicare. Medicare is not a problem because President Bush was evil or President Obama was evil. It's a problem we got more people and the baby boomers retiring, less workers to support them at the end of the day, and great health care that's being driven. So we need to get our act together and support this proposal. And I yield back. Gentleman from Ohio. Mr. Chairman, at this time, it's my pleasure to yield a minute and a half to my friend and classmate from New Hampshire, a co-sponsor of this uh, substitute, Charlie Bass. And I thank the gentleman, the gentleman from, from New Ohio. Hampshire is recognized for one and one half minutes. Thank the gentleman from Ohio for yielding to me. Mr. Chairman, I rise in support of the pending amendment. The budget presented by my friend from Wisconsin, Congressman Ryan, is a great statement of principle, and I will vote for it and I suspect that it will pass the House. But it will not be considered by the Senate. The Senate will not accept or pass appropriations at its levels, and there will be no reconciliation this year. Mr. Chairman, in nine short months, the Bush-era tax cuts will end. Taxes will go up by $4.6 trillion, the biggest tax increase in American history. The mindless, across-the-board cuts in spending in the sequester will take effect, cutting, amongst other programs, defense by over $400 billion. We'll have a vote to raise this nation's debt with no accomplishments to justify it. We will have to either renew or repeal the temporary pay payroll tax holiday. And we'll have to complete our appropriations at higher levels than in this budget, the, the, the base budget, or face the specter of continuing resolutions through next year. The American people have heard the debate on both sides 
And they are crying for solutions, not squabbling, not posturing, or policy brinksmanship. We all have principles. Compromise is not a capitulation of principle. It never has been. All of the great policy accomplishments of our nation's history have resulted from the willingness of men and women of principle to attack and resolve crises together through negotiation and, yes, compromise. We have that chance tonight. Mr. Speaker, I challenge Republicans and Democrats to vote for the La Tourette Cooper Simpson Bowles bipartisan budget tonight and make America proud of us once again. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Tennessee, who seeks recognition? He's, he's saving his to the end. Mr. Chairman, um, I would like to recognize my friend from Pennsylvania, Chaka Fatah, for one minute. Gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized for one minute. I rise in support of this bipartisan budget that's being offered uh, that would approach this in a balanced way, that is, with both cuts and additional revenues. It is the basis under which there's a majority support in our country. We have a responsibility to rise to the occasion, and I would hope tonight that we'd have members of this House that could rise above party, do what's right, let's move the country in a responsible way so that we can continue to make the investments we need so America can live up to its responsibilities to its citizens and to global leadership. Thank you. Gentleman from Wisconsin. I yield the additional 30 seconds to Mr. LaTourette. And uh, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman seek unanimous consent. <laughs> yes. Gentleman seeks unanimous consent. 30 seconds uh, to the and, gentleman from Ohio. And in the uh, spirit of unanimous consent, I would uh, ask unanimous consent that 15 of those precious seconds go to Mr. Cooper, <laughs> and then he'd be permitted to yield those 15 seconds as ever how he sees fit. Without objection? <laughs> Without objection. Thank you so much. And at this time, it's my pleasure to yield it to a new member of the House from the state of Illinois uh, and who has co-sponsored this substitute a great political peril, quite frankly, and he deserves to be rewarded by the citizens of Illinois and uh, not punished by the special interest groups on the right or left. Bob Dold of Illinois uh, for one minute. Gentleman from Illinois is recognized for one minute. Well, I certainly thank the gentleman for, for yielding and for his leadership on this. I also want to take the opportunity to thank my friend Paul Ryan for his work on the budget, which I think is so critical. As we look at, at budgets right now, there are not so many of them over in the United States Senate. And when I think about running a business or the families across the country that need to put together a budget, I think it's wrong that the United States government doesn't have one. Mr. Chairman, my children were on the floor today. They were here in Washington, D.C. And when I think about why I came to Washington, D.C., it's because of them. About the American dream for my children, about providing a country that's better off for them. We've got $15.5 trillion in debt. We borrow 42 cents of every single dollar. It's time that we put people before politics and progress before partisanship so that we can get something done. It's about providing solutions for our country so that we can come together, have a document that we can use to be able to move the country forward. We need to cut back rain in spending. We need to be able to provide that certainty for American businesses that are out there. This is our time. We, Republicans and Democrats alike, have to put the party bickering aside. We have to focus on the solutions that are out there. Am I going to like all of it? The answer is no, I'm not going to like all of it. Three seconds that I got from Mr. Ryan. The gentleman is recognized for an additional 15 seconds. I thank the chairman. I certainly thank Mr. La Tourette. The point is simply this, Mr. Chairman, for my children and yours, for the children of the next generation, the time is now. We have to stand up. We have to put together a budget. We have to do so. We have to find the common ground and move forward. We have to lower our corporate tax rates so that we can be more competitive in the global marketplace. This is our time. I vote, and I'm asking everyone a yes vote on the La Tourette Cooper Amendment. I thank my colleague from Tennessee for his leadership, my colleague from Ohio as well. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Tennessee. Mr. Chairman, may I ask how much time remains? Is it a minute, 15 gentleman, seconds? The <laughs> gentleman from Tennessee has one and three-quarter minutes remaining, including his additional 15 seconds. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Lotterette, has three minutes remaining. The gentleman from Wisconsin has two minutes remaining. Do my colleagues have any further speakers, or should I start the process of closing? 
Well, uh, Mr. Ryan has the right to close on behalf of the committee, and I'm, I'm the last speaker on our side, so if the gentleman right. wants to proceed, we gentleman can. The gentleman from Tennessee is recognized. Unless, unless Mr. Ryan wants to give us the rest of his time, we can finish <laughs> this right now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On November 2nd of last fall, a hundred of our colleagues signed a letter, the so-called Go Big letter, urging the Super Committee to do the right thing. And let me quote, to succeed, all options for mandatory and discretionary spending and revenues must be on the table. In addition, we know from other bipartisan frameworks that a target of some $4 trillion in deficit reduction is necessary to stabilize our debt as a share of the economy. This is what the Simpson-Bowles budget does, and only the Simpson-Bowles budget. For those of my colleagues who are worried about certain features of this, do not confuse the Simpson-Bowles report with a budget. A budget is just a framework. It's an outline. It instructs the committees to come up with certain savings, and the committees have discretion to come up with those savings in whatever way they choose. It's true that the Simpson-Bowles report is one way of achieving those savings, but this is a guide, a target for the committees of jurisdiction. That's what we must do tonight and do on a bipartisan basis. We must come together for the good of the country. We must put our nation first. We must set partisanship aside. This is the only way that we can pass a budget in the House and the Senate this year, which we must have. It's easy to be critical. It's hard to perform. Let's make it happen for America tonight. We have an opportunity within our hands to give the United States a budget. All of the other plans are purely partisan, and they don't have a prayer. Let's build a bridge to the future. Let's build a real budget that can pass both houses of Congress. I urge my colleagues to support the Simpson-Bowles endorsed budget alternative. I thank the chair and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from Ohio. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, yield myself the balance of our, our time in, uh, in support of this uh, proposal, and I understand that's three minutes. Is that right? gentleman is recognized for three minutes. I thank, the, I thank the chair very much. And again, I want to thank my partner, uh, Mr. Cooper, and I also want to thank all the brave Republicans and Democrats who are going to vote for this, all the brave Republicans and Democrats who co-sponsored it, because this is not an easy vote. Mr. Chairman, the last three elections have been the wildest elections I have seen in my uh, political life. Uh, and it's swung between party and party and party. And 2012 is going to be the same thing. But I'll tell you what's different. It's not the Democrats are going to take over, or the Republicans are going to take over. The mood in the country is throw the bums out. Throw them all out and replace them with new people. Americans are screaming for us to take off our red jerseys on this side, to take off the blue jerseys on that side, and put on the red, white, and blue jerseys of the United States of America. Our proposal, inspired by the Simpson-Bowles Fiscal Commission, authorized by the President of the United States, has been viciously attacked from the left and the right, and so I think, Cooper, we're on to something. I want to uh, make an observation from a pretty famous American made just a month ago in the Rose Garden down at the White House. The quote is, this may be an election year, but the American people have no patience for gridlock and just a reflexive partisanship, and just paying attention to poll numbers in the next election instead of the next generation and what we can do to strengthen opportunity for all Americans. Americans don't have the luxury to put off tough decisions, and neither should we. President Barack Obama, February the 21st, 2012. I've heard a lot of people say that this is hard work. That not now. Well, if not now, when? And if not this, what? Ever? Mr. Speaker, or Mr. Chairman, we're, we're asking uh, that members tonight stand up. That they stand up to the bloodsuckers in this town that take five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five dollars from our constituents to pretend to defend causes on their behalf. We're asking people to stand up that pledges that they have made twenty years ago when we didn't have a fifteen trillion dollar deficit owed to China. We're asking people to stand up to honor their pledge that they made on the opening day of the 112th Congress to defend the United States of America from all enemies, foreign and domestic, we ask that our colleagues stand up to America's biggest domestic threat and enemy, the $15 trillion, soon to be $22 trillion, that's staring us in the face. The time is now. We've got to get it done. This is the only bipartisan approach, and this is the only thing that has the chance to be adopted by both parties and the President of the United States who authorized Simpson-Bowles. I thank the chair and I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back his time.
Gentleman from Wisconsin. I'll, I'll close by saying, Mr. Chairman, um, how I started. I want to congratulate the gentleman for just showing a plan and coming together. But I would simply say the president disavowed this plan already. The Senate Majority Leader said he's not doing a budget this year, so I don't think anything's passing over there. Um, and I want to reserve the rest of my comments for the substance of this. And I'll reveal the private conversation I had with Simpson and Bowles as to why I was not supporting Simpson Bowles as a member of that commission. This doesn't go big. This doesn't tackle the problem. It doesn't do the big things. You can never get the debt under control if you don't deal with our health care entitlement programs. They're the ones that are the big drivers of our debt. So not only in addition to the, the fact that this keeps Obamacare in place, and it doesn't do Medicare and Medicaid reform, which are essential for preventing the debt crisis by repealing the tax exclusion as Simpson Bowles plans on doing, proposed to do, you're going to cause all of these employers to drop health insurance for their employees and push everybody into the health care law and Obamacare and the cost will explode. So I believe it will be do more harm than good at the end of the day. And I just don't think it's a balanced plan. I mean, if you look at the raw numbers, 72% of it is tax increases, and 28% of it is spending reductions. That, to me, is just not balanced. We don't want to create a new revenue machine for government without getting these entitlements under control. Let's not chase ever higher spending with ever higher revenues. And so I, I appreciate the sincerity and, 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 the, and the bipartisanship nature of this, but I just don't think the substance of this bill is right. I think it's going to worsen our fiscal situation by piling people into the health care law, and it's going to hasten the bankruptcy of Medicare. It's still going to stretch Medicaid, which grows by a third in eligibility, a program that's falling apart by the seams. And I believe these tax rate increases, the revenue increases, will just be used to fuel more spending. And that's why I urge a no vote on this bill, on the substance of it. All time. All time for debate has expired. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Tennessee. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. Opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Tennessee will be postponed. You ready? Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, proceedings will now resume on those amendments printed in House Report 112-423, on which further proceedings were postponed in the following order. Amendment number 1 by Mr. Mulvaney of South Carolina. Amendment number 2 by Mr. Cleaver of Missouri. Amendment number 3 by Mr. Cooper of Tennessee. The chair will reduce to five minutes the time for any electronic vote after the first vote in this series. The unfinished business is a request for a recorded vote on Amendment Number 1, printed in House Report 112-423 by the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Mulvaney, on which further proceedings were postponed and on which the noes prevailed by voice vote. The clerk will redesignate the amendment. Amendment Number 1, in the nature of a substitute, printed in House Report Number 112-423, offered by Mr. Mulvaney of South Carolina. A recorded vote has been requested. Those in support of the request for a recorded vote will rise and be counted. Sufficient number having risen, a recorded vote is ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. This is a 15-minute vote. Jonathan Nicholson with BNA News covering the budget debate. What's the purpose of a budget resolution? 
Um, in its most general form, it's to lay out um, expected spending, revenue, and deficit and debt levels for uh, coming years. On a practical level, uh, probably the most important thing it does is to lay out a, a top line uh, number for the appropriators to, uh, to divvy up uh, for the annual discretionary spending. Um, the stuff that's not that's outside of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, stuff like that. What are some of the highlights in the plan put forth by uh, Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan? Um, it's uh, very much like last year's plan in many respects. Um, it actually comes closer to uh, to um, to um, to uh, reducing the deficit, although it still adds about 240 billion over 10 years uh, compared to just simply current law, which would let the uh, tax cuts expire and the sequestration go into effect. The, uh, the, the, the across-the-board cuts are supposed to start in 2013. Um, but it's probably the most aggressive among, uh, among sort of the mainstream um, budget plans out there. Includes a Medicare overhaul, um, includes uh, a change in uh, tax rates, a simplification of the tax system. Um, uh, but even doing all this, it still doesn't show a surplus until 2040, but it uh, serves as a good uh, as, as the chairman Ryan has talked about, is a good sort of contrast uh, to Democrats who, over in the Senate, have not uh, have not passed the budget in quite a while. Well, in addition to the Ryan plan, six alternative budgets are expected to be debated in the House between today and tomorrow. What are the ones to watch for? Um, there's sort of the usual suspects: the Congressional um, Progressive Caucus, the Congressional Black Caucus, the Republican Study Committee. They usually those caucuses usually put out their own budgets each year. This year is a little bit interesting. The first one that will come up for debate will be one by uh, Mick Mulvaney, which is uh, an attempt to put uh, the budget submission by President Obama back in February into the form of a congressional budget resolution. So, people, so there can be a roll call vote on that. But the most interesting one to me is, uh, is the uh, cooper La Tourette, um resolution, which is an attempt to put into uh, budget resolution terms um, the uh, the approach taken by the uh, Presidential Commission back in 2010, the so-called uh, Simpson-Bowles Commission, um, and it attempts to set up in sort of broad terms because, again, these are more resolutions that kind of more sketch a general outline of fiscal policy than actual specifics, but it attempts to do sort of a two-third spending cut, one-third uh, revenue um, approach to deficit reduction. Um, that approach, the idea that all things should be on the table, spending uh, and revenues, um, was endorsed in a letter to the uh, to the uh, super committee last year by about uh, 100 um, 100 members of the house uh, members of both parties. Well, this, they had the house is spending uh, today and tomorrow on the budget. What about the Senate? Are they working their on their own budget proposal for next year? Um, um, Ch um, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid has said that uh, because last year's uh, debt ceiling deal, the Budget Control Act. Um, set a uh, top line, a limit of uh, $1.047 trillion for discretionary spending for this year, for this upcoming budget year, FY13, that there's no need um, to do a budget resolution of their own over in the Senate. Um, so he does not anticipate bringing one to the floor. There's a whole bunch of parliamentary issues involved there, which uh, basically um, if he did bring one to the if, – if he did uh, um, have a debate uh, – there's a lot of uh, politically tough votes that could happen, so Republicans have accused him of trying to shield his members uh, from tough votes. However, um, in committee, um, Chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, Kent Conrad, has said that he will, uh, at some point, try to mark up a budget resolution in his committee, so there would be some committee votes. But again, the, uh, the main thing is the Senate is not expected to do their own resolution, and they're going to be working from a different top line um, from what the, uh, from the House resolution is expected to pass. Uh, at 1.028 trillion, so basically about a 19 dollar, uh, 19 billion dollar difference that uh, was going to have to be hammered out by appropriators uh, before the end, of, before the beginning of the fiscal year, October 1. Keeping an eye on the uh, congressional budget debate, Jonathan Nicholson with BNA News. Thanks for that update. Thank you. I'm proud of the Simpson Bowles proposed budget. Hello? Hello, go ahead with your comment. Um, the Simpson Bowles budget, I think that we should honestly make an attempt to pass this budget 
because it is a fair approach. You can possibly get both parties to pass it, and they can pass the Senate, and you might be able to get the president to sign this budget because we sent folks in Washington to work together, not to fight each other at the lines. And and by this happening, a bipartisan group, I, I think if this should pass. I don't think we should be working on Paul Ryan or the uh, or the uh, or the Democrats that we should try to get this budget passed. You mentioned the bipartisan nature of the the proposal from Steve LaTourette and Jim Cooper. What do you think about the actual budget? What do you like about it? Well, first of all, we at first of all you have um revenue increases so it makes it starts to make the uh, top one percent pay its fair share of taxes okay and that measure calls for 1.2 trillion dollars in tax increases over the next 10 years yes all right we're going to try to get another call now abe from tucson arizona hi abe hi how are you good what's your comment um, I'd just like to insist that a focus on education, on public education in the elementary and um, middle school, high school levels is, is fundamental. And um, whichever whichever budget endorses uh, more resources for that area, um, I, I, I support. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, the knowledge as to which one of these most, um, you know, is most supportive of public education. And uh, hopefully you can tell me where, where I might find that. Um. The House is voting now on the President's budget plan. Uh, it includes uh, $3.7 trillion in spending, uh, $2.7 trillion in revenues, resulting in a $977 billion deficit for the year. The President's budget is uh, being offered by Republican Representative Nick Mulvaney. Uh, the National Journal writes that the conservative freshman is doing that to force a show vote on the administration's budget plan. Our next call is from a Republican, John from New York. John, can you turn down your television? Yes. Um, so, I think uh, my biggest concern is with uh, the third uh, amendment proposed. I think it's a great amendment. And while I share the concerns of Paul Ryan, I think he's uh, neg neglecting the fact that most of the health care bill is going to be deemed unconstitutional in about uh, a couple of months, and most of the spending will be gone. Thanks for that call. You can see the numbers at the bottom of your screen for Democrats, uh, Republicans, and all others. There are seven budget plans uh, that the House is debating. Roll call referred to the House floor today as the Baskin-Robbins of budgets. Every political persuasion has its own flavor and that members have said they'll double dip and vote for multiple spending plans. But it's becoming increasingly clear that Budget Chairman Paul Ryan's blueprint is the only one that can pass the House. However, the National Journal writing that it would be a symbolic victory at best uh, since the Senate is not expected to take up the GOP plan. We're going to watch the vote here in the House for a few minutes.
We're taking your calls about the budget proposals here in the House. Democrats call 202-585-3885. Republicans 202-585-3886. That's 585-3886. And all others 202-585-3887. Our first call is from Palm Coast, Florida. Richard, hello. Hello. So what do you think about the budget debate? I'm in favor of Paul Ryan's budget. The other two don't seem to address any, any uh, revisions to the tax codes in order to get uh, the revenue that they need, plus the cuts that they need, you need to revise the tax code. And the only way, that's the only budget plan that I've seen so far that does that. Okay, the Associated Press writes that the GOP plan by Representative Ryan, a chairman of the Budget Committee, would quickly bring the deficit to heel, but only through unprecedented cuts to programs for the poor, uh, such as food stamps, Medicaid, college aid, college aid, and housing subsidies. Our next call is from Smith, Oregon, an independent caller. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I think the biggest problem is that the House of Representatives and Congress are stealing the money from Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and putting it where they want to put it instead of using it what we pay for it for. Okay. And have you heard about uh, Representative Ryan's plan to change how Medicare would work? I I don't think changing Medicare would work. I think you need to change the House and Congress of using the money where they're not supposed to be using it. Okay, well, thanks for calling in. Uh, a little bit more about Representative Ryan's plan. Uh, he would switch the Medicare plan uh, for those people that are under 55 today uh, from the traditional framework in which the government pays doctors and hospital bills to a voucher-like approach uh, where the government would subsidize a buying private health insurance. Our next call is from Harold. He's a Republican calling from Vancouver, Washington. Hello, Harold. Yes, and I want to back Simpson Bowles. I think that uh, that will move the country forward. Yes, we can debate for a long time about its little nuances, but at least we'll get moving going forward instead of, uh, as we are, just locked in a standstill. Thank you. All right, thanks for calling in. During the debate, one of the co-sponsors of that legislation, Jim Cooper of Tennessee, said that the bipartisan proposal that includes the Erskine Bowles uh, Commission recommendations is the only one that stands a chance of passing uh, both the House and the Senate. Our next call is Billy from West Virginia. Uh, hello. Hello, what is, what's your comment? Uh, my comment is... Uh, Myself, personally, I don't think uh, Medicare is an entitlement program. I think we have all worked to pay into that, and I worked until I was 55 years old and could not work no more. And uh, as far as party goes, I see no difference in the party one way or the other. But I would I'd like to say one thing. Why does not Congress give up 5% of their uh, salaries. I mean, they're asking the rest of the country to sacrifice. Why not our statesmen? So Thank you very much. Our next call is Don in North Carolina. Don, have you been watching the debate? Yes, I am. So what proposal um, gets your attention? Well, uh, I haven't seen it mentioned on, in the debate on TV, but I've read something in a, a magazine that I get from the Military Office Association. I'm retired military, and with uh, 28 years service, they are now going to uh, charge me $3,000 a year in copay for TRICARE, which is the military services uh, retired uh, health insurance coverage. It's, it's secondary to Medicare. Uh, and that's about 10% of my pay, according to the Military Office Association. And that is, uh, I think it's a, it's a ripoff to me as a military retired person. I spent almost 28 years there, and 
I have I became eligible for Tricare. That's called Tricare for Life. And not when I turned 65 years old. And uh, <clears throat> I think if they need to raise revenue, instead of taking off the backs of the people who served 28 years in the military service for this country. They should take it off the people, the back of the people who are receiving the benefit. Well, so do any of the proposals, having said that, do any of the proposals appeal to you? Uh, no, not in this budget. All right. The next call, we have Jonathan from Illinois. You're a Democrat. Is that right, Jonathan? That's correct. What do you think about the budget debate? Well, you know why? It just disturbs me greatly to watch that farce on, on, on television and what they're doing there, and they're like it's all a joke to the American people. I hope and pray that the American people don't forget that the budget was balanced when Clinton left office and that the Republicans had two terms, and they completely uh, just run it out. Sky high, and now they're trying to say that the Democrats are tax and spend and all this. And if the American people fall for this, I, 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 I'm just going to move to new, to another country. I, I'm just so tired of it all. It, it, watching that this evening in that farce about the uh, whether or not it was uh, the president's budget. You know, and, and this health care thing, definitely we need reform. I don't know that it's, it maybe need to be tweaked or whatever. We definitely need that. But you, the, the health care in this country, I get tired of people saying I'm tired of paying their way. These people that Medicare and, well, Medicaid pays for, they never see any of that money. It's hospitals, clinics, doctors living in the big house up on the hill, driving the Mercedes, who are ripping off Medicare, hospitals, clinics, and doctors. You know, I just hope the American people don't fall for all this rhetoric. I mean, uh, uh, I feel sorry for uh, President Obama, and not just because I'm a Democrat. If, he, if I didn't really feel this way, I wouldn't be saying what I'm saying. I just hope and pray that the American people don't forget who ran us into this these Okay, Jonathan, uh, thanks Bye. for calling in. Uh, Jonathan is a Democrat, and we're going to go now to Nathan in Woodbury, Michigan. He's a Republican. What's happening in Michigan there, Nathan? <laughs> Are you watching the debate? Yes, I am. Actually, I come from Woodbury, Minnesota, yeah. And I got a message to American people that's kind of related to this hell so, uh uh, budget. All right. Uh, so, do you have a specific budget that you like that you've been listening to the debate? Yeah, I'm kind of worried about the health care reform that's currently uh, facing the country, and uh, they just finished up a deliberation of the Supreme Court, Supreme Court today, okay. and I'm kind of worried that I got to think thinking of this takes all of our m money, forces us to pay us for health care, for health care for things. That oh, sorry for cutting you off, Nathan. Our next call is from Robert. He's an independent. Hello? Hello, Robert. Yes. So have you been watching the debate? Uh, yeah, I watch it pretty faithfully about every day, and I'm getting pretty fed up. Uh, right now, if these people don't vote for the Bull Simpson, nothing's going to get passed. And uh, if they want to save a lot of money, I think our senators and congressmen, I think they need to go part-time and cut their wages in half, and then we'll see how patriotic they are with less pay. And uh, I just think this, I'm just making a mess out of everything. Up next, uh, we have two more votes in this series. Uh, the next vote will be on the Congressional Black Caucus budget proposal for 2013. And after that, the bipartisan proposal that we just heard about.
Right. On this vote, the yeas are zero and the nays are 414. The amendment is not adopted.